So, uh, so today, uh, Nicholas Garner from University of Washington will give his first lecture on non-semi-simple TKFTs from 3D and equal four QFTs. Okay, please, Nicholas. Great, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to get to speak in this M seminar. Um, this work uh, came out at the end of 2021 with, uh, in collaboration with Tudor de Mokta, Thomas Kreutzig and Nathan Gear. Um, and the big picture of what we were trying to do was to understand a quantum field theory that in some sense generalizes Chern Simons theory um, and its connections to vertex operator algebras and uh, quantum groups. Um, so that sort of original story is summarized in this slide here. Um, Witten showed us that SU2 and SUN Chern Simons theories are particularly interesting three-dimensional topological quantum field theory whose correlation functions of extended operators, in particular Wilfen lines, give interesting not invariants in three manifolds, generalizing the Jones polynomial um, to things other than S3 or R3. The way this was done, at least traditionally in his original paper, was to relate the turn simons quantum field theory, this thing up at the top, to a related object that is entirely algebraic um, by way of a, a holomorphic boundary condition. Namely, you look at turn simons theory on a three-dimensional manifold that has a boundary. Um, and on the boundary, you impose a holomorphic Dirichlet boundary condition. So this is just some particular version of a Dirichlet boundary condition where you use a particular choice of complex structure on the boundary two-dimensional manifold. And he was able to show that the algebra of local operators on this boundary condition can be identified with a certain vertex operator algebra known as uh, West Amino Witten uh, current algebra or vertex operator algebra um, associated to the Lie algebra SUN at level K. Um, concretely, this is a simple quotient of the universal affine vertex algebra. And it um, is a particularly well studied and particularly simple example of a vertex operator algebra. Um, there's a similar construction due to Rashitikin and Tarayev of Jones polynomial-like not invariant by starting with the quantum group associated to that same Lie algebra, or perhaps its complexification at a root of unity Q that is uh, a two kth root of unity. So this, this quantum parameter Q is related to the level of my affine current algebra and the level of my Chern Simons gauge theory. Um, and so on one side, we can go from Chern Simons theory to a vertex operator algebra and use this vertex operator algebra to describe aspects of the correlation functions of extended operators. And in the same way, we can come up with a second algebraic description in terms of an a priori different algebraic gadget, a quantum group. Um, and those two algebraic gadgets are themselves related to one another via a kajdan lustig type correspondence, or sorry, not type correspondence, the kajdan lustig correspondence, where the category of modules for the current algebra on the right is related to a certain category of modules for the uh, algebra, algebra proper on the left, the quantum group. So, but uh, the connection with the remaining vertex, it's sort of 
besides of the construction of the Jones polynomial, it's still hypothetical, yeah, because I totally agree. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, morally, this is this is the way the story is expected to go, but I I totally agree. Um, spelling out all of those details is still not done. It's it's sort of like the moral picture of what should happen, um, and exactly as you say, it's not not proven mathematics, but certainly expected. I think I think it's it's fair to say that it's definitely expected. Um, Mm -hmm. In any case, um, the categories associated to the two algebraic objects are module categories. We have modules for the quantum group. We have modules for the uh, vertex operator algebra. And this corresponds to this category C that I have at the center of this triangle. And in the physical turn simons theory, this category is a category of so-called line operators. These are um, observables in my quantum field theory that aren't supported at points like you might be familiar with, but they extend along curves in space-time. And the support of these curves, or the support of these operators, these curves in space-time, encode the, the knots whose invariance we are interested in calculating. Um, one important feature of, of chern simons theory and also the vertex operator algebra, this affine um, WZW model, is that there is, um, the category itself is actually a semi-simple category uh, so that any object can be written as a direct sum of simple objects. It's an abelian category because it comes from modules, um, for example. And physically, this semi-simplicity is a statement of the fact that the Wilson lines, who are these line operators in the chern simons theory, have no local operators or junctions between them. As we'll see, these junctions are the morphisms in the category of line operators. These Wilson lines are the simple objects. And if you have different Wilson lines, there are no line operators that can connect. Sorry, there's no local operators that connect them. And there's only one local operator connecting a line to itself. So this is the statement that our category has all of these symbols and every object can be written as a direct sum of these things. In terms of the vertex operator algebra, sorry, is, that, is there a question? Uh, yes, uh, just in the uh, lower part, the quantum group of vertex algebra that uh, you have a finite number of uh, irreducibles. So in the Chern-Simons theory, is that finite irreducible? Finite number of irreducibility, irreducibles, or is that yeah, automatic? In, um, it is not. Um, it is definitely a feature of the Chern Simons theory. Um, you don't need to do anything to the Chern Simons theory to get uh, this truncation of the of the Wilson lines. It's a phenomenon known as um, as screening, and I'll mention some aspects of it later. But it's not something you need to add to the Chern Simons theory. Um, it's it's a feature that's already already present in it. Uh, okay, Nicholas, thank you. Nicholas, also kind of one uh, a remark about this Kazdan Lustig. Uh, of course, there is a vertex separator algebra, but Kazdan Lustig, it's a statement about representations of UQ, whatever SLN or UQ yeah. G and representations of, of um, uh, quantum um, affine uh, Lie algebra of cut smoothie uh, at, the, at the level K. Yes. You, you, yeah, uh, because uh, if you also involve VOA structure, uh, what does it mean on the quantum group side? Um, well, there... There's a functor from the category of of modules for the affine algebra you're mentioning. So you can consider yeah, the affine yeah, the, the algebra. Yeah, this um, at level K. K. Yeah. Um, with, with, with a special <clears throat> with a special tensor product, which is its fusion tensor product for affine, uh, which preserves the level, which preserves this K. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um and um 
but VOA is some bonus. I mean, at least I don't remember that Kajdan and Lustig used, maybe Zungzhu can correct me, but I don't remember they were using VOA structure. Well, Kajdan and Lustig did, that's uh, not for the small quantum group, but it was uh, for the uh, universal vertex algebra. Um, ah, even, though, even though they didn't say it, but uh, um, there is a way to construct from the quantum group by taking some tilting modules and some people call that a, a semi-simplification process. That, so that will produce only a finite number of irreducibles and get a really yeah, nice, very nice that's the thing that you, Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's the thing that you really want to be working with in the Chern-Simons or to reproduce Chern-Simons theory. That's sort of the, the thing I was about to get at um, because this, this WZW model is is rational. It's not the same thing as modules for the universal affine VOA. Um, the thing you really want to be talking about is actually this simple quotient of the affine VOA, of the universal affine VOA. And that requires you to do something quite brutal to the quantum group, namely this uh, universal, sorry, the simple quotient of the aff universal affine VOA is a rational vertex algebra. And this is going to correspond to a semi-simple category of modules. Yeah. The okay. quantum group is far from a semi-simple algebra. Its category of modules is not at all semi-simple. And so you have to do something quite brutal to it in order to relate this to Chern-Simons theory or to the WZW um, VOA. Yeah, it's not semi-simple mm -hmm. roots of unity for generic Q, of course. It's yeah, yeah, but, but we want but to be yeah, working at Q. Yeah, and, uh, but uh, if if one takes the tilting module with only has the weight in the restricted, um, in, in the in the very bottom of curve, so yeah, that yeah, produces that, exactly well, what, number. Yeah, but well, that's what he said that you should. Yeah, cut, yeah that's cut, exactly cut, what cut, it cut, meant. Cut. Okay, mm. okay, okay. It was a brutal. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I really appreciate all of the comments. Um, so the 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 point I, I want to get at is this Chern-Simons theory only sees a very small portion of the quantum group. You have to do this semi-simplification procedure where you throw away all of these modules with non with vanishing quantum dimensions. And one of the aims of our project was to identify what replaces Chern-Simons theory when we want to look at the entire category of modules for the quantum group at a root of unity, which is a non-semi-simple category. So we have to step away from the realm of semi-simple top topological quantum field theory and theories like Chern-Simons theory or SUN at level K um, if we want to be able to access the entire quantum group. And so one point I want to, to emphasize is that non-semi-simple TQFT is a much harder than semi-simple topological quantum field theory. For example, you often find that partition functions need to be regularized when you are computing um, path integrals, for example. In, this, in a similar fashion, you often find that state spaces on Riemann surfaces are infinite dimensional and if you specialize to the two sphere, that in turn is related to the fact that there are non-trivial algebras of local operators in the quantum field theory itself. Um, and from the perspective of vertex operator algebras, this means going beyond rational vertex algebra, vertex operator algebras that have semi-simple categories to so-called logarithmic vertex operator algebras whose categories are sort of by definition non-semi-simple. Yeah, and if I uh, replace a compact gauge group for its complexification, will it give the same phenomenon? I think it should. Um, you can also replace the bosonic or the compact yeah. group by a compact but Super group, super yeah. group. Yeah, and you'll right. run into similar features. And I was hoping to say a couple words about some work I've done with yeah. Wen Zhen Yu about um, U11 
uh, supergroup churn simons. Uh, but we'll save that for later. Today, mm -hmm. I'm going to try to focus on the sort of physical features that we want to describe and illustrate them in a, a particularly simple example that actually fits into our larger story of generalizing churn simons theory to some non-semi-simple uh, topological quantum field theory that realizes the entire quantum group. And of course, the bottom right corner is also going to change. We're not going to be talking about an SUN current algebra anymore. We'll be replacing it by um, by the Fig and Tipunin algebras, as, as we'll see. And that uh, bottom line will be supplanted by some logarithmic kajian lushti correspondence where the entire category of modules for the quantum group at uh, an even root of unity are related to the category of modules for this big and Tipunin algebra. And um, in the top, we're going to have a yet different topological quantum field theory um, that has an, has an analogous structure uh, to this triangle I've drawn here, where the Rajatik and Tarayev um, construction is replaced by it's non semi simple generalization due to Gear, Blanchet, and Petro Miron. Um, so that's that's sort of the big picture of what's going to be happen happening over the next few lectures. I'm hoping to illustrate uh, today just the simplest version of this story. And uh, in the next two lectures, I was hoping to describe how we arrived at the quantum field theory. Uh, we propose to fit at the very top and how the bottom right corner shows up in that uh, in that quantum field theory or the thing that replaces the current algebra uh, shows up in that non-semi-simple quantum field theory. But today I just wanted to talk about some physical things and illustrate these properties in a, a, a very simple example. Um, so before I go on, are there any other questions? Okay, great. Um, so the first thing I want to do is to set the stage for the things that we will be trying to study, the quantum field theories that will be the origin of the topological quantum field theory we will be interested in eventually come from a class of three-dimensional quantum field theories that have supersymmetry in particular, we're going to be interested in three-dimensional n equals four quantum field theories. So these uh, are, are becoming increasingly well studied. Um, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of what the important features of these things are, sort of the basic building blocks uh, and the things that we'll be interested in, uh, in later. Um, the first thing I'll mention is that the 3dn equals 4 supersymmetry algebra has an R symmetry uh, given by SO4 or spin 4 if you like, where uh, this R symmetry measures the symmetries of the supersymmetry algebra. This SO4 rotates the four supercharges in n equals 4 uh, amongst one another as a, as a vector. And using our favorite exceptional isomorphism, we can relate SO4 to two copies of SO2, sorry, SO3 or SU2 uh, that are commonly denoted um, SU2H and SU2C or uh, Higgs and Coulomb. And all of the fields that we have will be sitting in representations of this SO4 R symmetry group. And um, in the following, uh, indices A and A dot will correspond to uh, indices for the fundamental representation of SU2H and SUT, F, SU2C Coulomb, um, respectively. So this uh, will be one of the organizing features that we'll be using in describing these quantum field theories. But the basic Building may blocks I, that we may, may I interrupt? The R here stands for real or? Um, R stands for R symmetry. So R -symmetry. in in okay. in supersymmetric quantum field theory, there are uh, roughly speaking two types of internal symmetries that you might be interested in. There mm -hmm. are the symmetries that 
preserve the supercharges that don't act on them at all, or the supercharges are invariant under them. And those are what you usually call flavor symmetries or internal symmetries of a supersymmetric quantum field theory. <laughs> but as a quantum field theory as a whole, there are other symmetries which do not preserve the supercharges. They rotate the supercharges uh, within one another. And these are called R, R symmetries. Okay. Um, when you have uh, a three-dimensional quantum field theory with N supercharges, this means you have N real spinners um, of fermionic symmetries. The There's an SON symmetry that rotates them into one another. And so this SO4R is um, a symmetry of our quantum field theory that doesn't preserve our supersymmetry, but instead rotates the supersymmetry in an interesting way. You can think of it as the automorphisms of, of my symmetry algebra, of the n equals okay. four supersymmetry algebra. Okay, thank you. At first I thought it was a real and then Hermes. Oh, no, 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 yeah. <laughs> thank you for the question. Yeah, good, thank you. Um, okay, great. So the, the basic building blocks that we'll be using to describe these uh, quantum field theories um, come in essentially two flavors. The first flavor of, of building block that we have are called hypermultiplets. You should think of these as sort of the matter fields in my supersymmetric quantum field theory. Um, it contains a doublet of complex fields, ZA. So A is one and two corresponding to the two-dimensional representation of SU2 Higgs. So this doublet gets transformed as a in the standard representation of SU2 Higgs and does not transform under SU2 Coulomb. Um, these are scalar fields on space-time, so they do not transform under um, Lorentz rotations in any way or in in the in an invariant way, or I guess just by acting on the argument of the field. In addition to the complex scalars ZA and their complex conjugates Z bar A, we have a doublet of spinners. So this alpha index corresponds to the spinner index of Lorentz rotations. So we have a, a collection of fermions and we have a doublet of them. So um, this A dot index indicates that I have two, two such spinners and they transform trivially under this SU2 Higgs and transform as a doublet under SU2C. So these are the matter fields that we will be using. Um, in addition to the matter fields, there are gauge fields these fit in what's called a vector multiplet. Um, inside this vector multiplet, we have three real scalars, sigma a, b dot, where a and b are symmetrized. So there's three possibilities. You can think of this as being the adjoint representation of SU2 Coulomb. We also have our gauge field a. This index mu indicates it's a space-time uh, one form. It's like, it's our connection one form. Um, and additionally, oh, I shouldn't have called that field psi. Um, let me call it something else and then I'll send an updated version of this after the talk, I'll call it lambda. Um, but in any case, this extra fermionic field inside of the vector multiplet has uh, non-trivial transformation properties with respect to both Higgs and Coulomb R symmetries and this alpha just denotes that they transform as spinners on space-time in the same way as the size. There's also twisted versions of these. I won't really be talking about them too much, but I just wanted to mention them for... Um, uh, is the is the A mu bosonic or fermionic? Um, a mu is going to be a bosonic field. So it's, okay. it's a connection on a principal G bundle for G compact semi-simple Lie group. Okay, Maybe not semi-simple, but definitely compact Lie group. Um, 
Okay, so as I was mentioning earlier, there are sort of two types of symmetries of uh, supersymmetric quantum field theory. There are the R symmetries, which are automorphisms of the supersymmetry algebra that can act on our quantum field theory. Um, in addition, there are also symmetries that do not act on the supersymmetries, but instead rotate our fields into one another uh, in a way that preserves supersymmetry. Um, because we have two different types of uh, R symmetries, or rather we have two different types of vector multiplets. We have these vector multiplets that I was talking about, as well as their twisted versions where I replace A with A dot and B with B dot. Uh, there are two types of symmetries of a 3D n equals four quantum field theory, or two types of, of flavor symmetries of these theories. The first type is called a, a Higgs branch flavor symmetry, and it's denoted G sub H. And these couple to background vector multiplets. So these are the types of uh, super, this is the type of flavor symmetry that couples to this type of, uh, sorry, uh, this type of, um, of gauge field. And in the same way, there's a second type of super symmetry, or a uh, second type of flavor symmetry that couples to these twisted versions of vector multiplets. And these are called Coulomb branch flavor symmetries. Um, some examples of like of a uh, 3D n equals four theories include sigma models, um, where we have our hypermultiplets transforming um, as maps from our space time to some hyperkähler target. Uh, the fermions psi transform in uh, a pullback of the tangent bundle. There are no gauge fields in this first class called sigma models. Um, it's just it's just matter fields. Uh, the next type of quantum field theory are gauge linear sigma models, where we have some collection of vector multiplets that act on hypermultiplets that transform in a quaternionic representation of our gauge group G. And these are going to be some of the main ones that we're interested in. Uh, the third class is the actual ones that we will be trying to study. And these are um, Chern-Simons matter theories that have n equals four supersymmetry. These are quite special and are usually not talked about because of, um, because of sort of how exotic they are. Um, but they were discovered by Gaioto and Witten um, in the context of studying boundary conditions of 40 n equals four super Yang mills. And one of the, um, just a, a small sampling of the types of theories that fit into this exotic turn Simons matter collection include the fabled ABJM superconformal quantum field theory describing the world volume theory of M2s. Um, and there's also a way to couple this sigma model I had in the first line to a different type of gauge field where we allow for a churn simons type kinetic term. Here, the kinetic term is of Yang-Mill type, so it's like an F wedge star F. Here, Gaioto and Witten were able to find that for a very special class of hyperkähler targets, you can actually couple them to gauge fields with a, a churn simons kinetic term at some level K. And so this is, at the end of the day, going to be the type of quantum field theory we're going to want to understand. Um, because of sort of how exotic they are, they are often hard to get a handle on, but um, using some fun tricks, we were able to describe what we wanted. Um, Rosansky witten belongs to... rosansky witten theory, great question, sits right here. Um, sort of. Uh, on, on the next slide, I will mention uh, how to extract rosansky witten theory from one of these n equals four theories. Um, but morally speaking, rosansky witten theory will sit inside of that top row, the hyperkähler uh, sigma model. OK, so at the end of the day, we wanted something that's topological. We're going to be talking about topological quantum field theory. Um, but these 3D n equals four theories I'm telling you about are not topological, but they can be twisted. 
What I mean by that is illustrated on this slide. Um, within our supersymmetry algebra, we pick a favorite supercharge Q that's nil potent, so it squares to zero. And we restrict to observables, so like line operators, local operators, boundary conditions that are invariant with respect to our distinguished supercharge Q. So long as we work in a, a a vacuum state that preserves this supersymmetry. We don't spontaneously break this supersymmetry. Um, operators that are the images of something with respect to this supercharge Q, so they're variations of other things with respect to Q, they necessarily vanish in correlation functions. So instead of just looking at Q closed things, we can actually look at the quotient of Q closed things by Q exact things. And this leads us to the notion of cohomology, of course. And so rather than um, looking at all observables in a non-topological quantum field theory, we can instead look at observables that are um, invariant under this supersymmetry modulo those observables that are exact with respect to the supersymmetry. And this is something that comes directly from just restricting to Q closed things. We sort of get automatically that the Q exact things act as zero in these correlation functions. It turns out that not all of these supercharges are topological and you have to impose some extra constraints on them. In particular, in the supersymmetry algebra, we require that there are other supercharges that I'll denote Q sub mu so that the bracket of our distinguished supercharge Q with this collection of supercharges Q sub mu realize all possible momentum generators P mu. Pragmatically, what this says is that every single infinitesimal translation is homotopically trivial. Namely, if you have some operator um, O whose derivative I write as del mu O, um, this is necessarily going to be something that sits in the Q exact part of these operators. Um, and that's, that's illustrated here and just follows by applying a, 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 a sort of Jacobi type identity together with this formula up here and the fact that O is Q closed. So what we see is that in a twisted quantum field theory, if we choose our supercharge Q sufficiently well, um, so that we have these extra Q mu's that um, provide all momentum uh, when we take this bracket, then the resulting quantum field theory doesn't depend on infinitesimal translations of my local operators, at least up to Q exact terms. And correspondingly, the quantum field theory will be topological. Um, namely, it doesn't care at all where we place our local operators. We're free to move them around as we please um, at, at no cost um, up to Q exact terms, of course. So this is some topolo or some homotopical weakening of the usual notion of a topological quantum field theory, which is topological on the nose. Instead, we work with a weakened version of it where things are only topological sort of up to homotopy. These Q mu's are the things that implement the, they are the homotopies for translations. Um, so within a 3DN equals four topological quantum field theory, there are actually two topological twists. Um, so if I have some 3DN equals four quantum field theory uh, that I'll call T, there are actually uh, three different types of twists, at least up to equivalence. Two of them are topological. So this is what I'm calling A and B. Um, and then the third one is not quite topological, but it's very close. It's what's called holomorphic topological. And I won't talk too much about the holomorphic topological twist today, but I might say some uh, in the next two lectures where we use the holomorphic topological twist to actually get access to these A and B twists using um, two special deformations of the holomorphic topological supercharge into the 
two different topological supercharges, namely this supercharge QA that leads to the A twist and the supercharge QB, which leads to the B twist, can actually be realized as small deformations of this holomorphic topological twist. But in any case, let me just mention some of the important features of these two topological twists. Let's start with a B twist because we've already heard some things about rosansky witten theory. Um, this topological B twist, when you consider the sigma models I was mentioning before, leads exactly to rosansky witten theory. Um, if you've seen some things about twisting homomorphisms and changing spins in topological twists, um, this quantum field or this topological twist uses a combination of the usual rotation group and the uh, Coulomb branch R symmetry group to define a new symmetry transform or a new rotation action on your quantum field theory uh, under which this QB supercharge transforms as a scalar. If you want to have an action of rotations on your quantum field theory, then you need to do this because the supercharges transform as spinners under this uh, this rotation group of space time. If you want to have an action that commutes with your supercharge, you have to redefine your action of rotations in a way that this supercharge transforms as a scalar or it is invariant. And so in order to do this, this B type supercharge uses a diagonal SU2 uh, spin spin three inside of um, the product of usual rotations and um, SU2 Coulomb rotations. Uh, one thing I'll mention is that this doesn't have a four dimensional analog, namely uh, the 3D n equals four algebra can be realized as dimensional as a dimensional reduction of the 4D n equals two supersymmetry algebra, and there is no analog of the of the B twist in that uh, 4D n equals two algebra. Um, this theory is, of course, rosansky witten theory. Uh, when you look at the sigma models I was mentioning before, um, as uh, topological quantum field theory, it has some algebra of local operators that I'm going to call ops T B. Um, and these are going to be a graded commutative algebra. Um, it actually has a shifted Poisson structure and it's identified with the algebra functions on a variety um, or um, yeah, I'll just call it a variety that is denoted the Higgs branch, M sub H. Uh, is it minus two shifted or it's actually zero shifted Poisson? So it's, uh, it's definitely two shifted. shifted. It's a minus two, it's a degree minus two thing. Mm -hmm. The symplectic form has weight two and so the Poisson uh, tensor is weight minus two. Okay. And uh, um, I ask you a naive question from mathematics. Yeah, uh, of course. With a few, uh, this um, kind of uh, in your whatever uh, polygon <laughs> upstairs, you have two topological twists, and you have something in the middle holomorphic topology. Is there a kind of continuous family, something like twister family of 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 um, twists? So this T A and T B are just kind of, or, or there are many, uh, are there only uh, two uh, topological uh, twists A and B, or there is uh, plenty of them related um, to some discrete group of symmetries or something? There is the, uh, so th there's a couple symmetries that act on the supersymmetry algebra that relate the twists to one another. So I had this R symmetry rotation that I was mentioning. And there's also space time rotations that will act on my supercharges because they transform as spinners on space time. And additionally, there are like parity transformations where you can send like one of your coordinates to its uh, to negative of that coordinate. And so the statement I was um, alluding to was the statement that um, 
up to these equivalences by rotations um, and R symmetry transformations and parity transformations, there's only two choices hmm. of holomorphic, sorry, two choices of topological twist. But of course, they there are many more than that if you don't impose equivalences. And there are indeed, um, uh, there's a nice way to include this until into one uh, P1 family, um, the P1 that gets rotated by uh, SU2 Higgs um, acts on the P1 family of these B type supercharges. Um, and in the same way, there's a P1 family of A type supercharges that gets rotated by the SU2 Coulomb. And a choice of one of those supercharges on this P1 is related to a choice of complex structure on my hypercalar uh, moduli space. So that's why I was saying it's, it's sort of a variety once I've chosen a particular uh, point on that twister sphere. Um, and, yeah, but you also... If, yeah, excuse me. If you impose this equivalence relation, so you have these two remarkable topological uh, twists, and uh, in the middle uh, you have what it's nothing except of this holomorphic topological twist or there is also some interesting uh, yeah uh, i would say that it uh so the i i guess what i might say is that the two p1s that i was mentioning uh, uh -huh. sort of are glued at a at a point in the middle um and that point in the middle is this holomorphic topological supercharge um, namely, if you start at this one point, you can add a little bit of A to get into the A type P1, or you can add a little bit of B to get into the B type P1. Um, so in some sense, this A and B type supercharges um, live in families that sort of meet at the holomorphic topological supercharge. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, one other thing I, I want to mention. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. of course. So no I noticed that uh, your notation on the left column that uh, um, the SU2 you are using H for the uh, Higgs and but the C the function algebra you are using MC for column and vice yes. versa on the B, uh, B twist side. Is there a reason for that? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, the other SU2, so the mm -hmm. SU2 mm -hmm. C. Uh, that I didn't use on this left-hand side is the SU2 that rotates the twister uh, sphere of the hypercalar target. So the Higgs okay, and okay. Coulomb subscripts of these R symmetry groups denote which twister sphere of of complex structures you're rotating on the moduli space. And okay. when you're defining the twisted Lorentz groups action, you use the other SU2 that doesn't act on the corresponding uh, twister sphere. Mm -hmm. I have another question that's in the, let's say on the B twist side mm -hmm. and uh, the, the operator and the, the function algebra M, uh, MH. Yeah. And how about the, um, the important orbital Q? Uh, does that still just uh, becomes zero or what, which still has a possibly non-zero action on the function algebra? Um, so are you referring to this P1 family of B-type supercharges that I was uh, well, physical, or was... physical things I'm not familiar because in the, um, before do the, you did the twist, when you do the twist, you have a new orbit 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 on Q, right? So in, in the previous page, which is a square zero and so yeah, so are when you when you say nil potent orbit, do you yeah, mean the, the, the orbit the of, this, yeah, of the supercharge with respect yes. to the symmetries? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the uh, on the function uh, algebra, I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, not strictly. What um, what I would say is a choice of one of those points on the nil potent orbit is mm -hmm. it's equivalent to a choice of complex structure on the. Um, on the Higgs or Coulomb branch. Namely, when, when I do the topological twist, um, I've chosen one of these, a point on this twister sphere and thereby choose what are holomorphic functions on my on my target space. And so if I were to use a different point on this P1, I would get a different 
set of complex functions, uh, sorry, holomorphic functions dictated by which choice on this uh, twister sphere I'm sitting. Okay. Okay. Thank um, you. But, but they're all equivalent to one another um, by rotations of uh, of the twister sphere, um, and this is related to the statement that um, there is this P1 family of of B type supercharges, but they're all equivalent to one another. Um, mm -hmm. So the resulting quantum field topological quantum field theory you get by twisting is going to be the same up to like a different choice of your complex structure in some sense. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, okay, so staying on this B-type side, I wanted to mention that if you couple to a background um, gauge symmetry for the, sorry, background gauge fields for this Coulomb branch, sorry, Higgs branch flavor symmetry, um, these things couple to vector multiplets, as I was mentioning before, the B-type twist is preserved by backgrounds that are uh, complexified flat connections, namely this gauge field A together with the triplet of real scalars form a complexified flat connection that you can use to deform the B-twist by. So this B-twist can be deformed by flat connections for Higgs branch flavor symmetries. This Higgs branch flavor symmetry acts by rotating the Higgs branch um, via tri-Hamiltonian isometries. Um, the A-twist is uh, relatively similar, just to highlight the differences. The A-twist does come from a dimensional reduction of four dimensions. It comes from the, the Donaldson twist that Witten introduced. Um, the algebra of local operators in the A-twist corresponds to the algebra of functions on a different moduli space called the Coulomb branch. And the um, background vector multiplets um, don't land on complexified flat connections anymore, but they transform, they land on a version of uh, BPS monopoles. Uh, so the background you're allowed to introduce is a sort of monopole type background rather than a, a flat background. And these deformations by background flat connections are gonna be central to our um, connections to quantum groups and and invariants of, of three manifolds. Okay, so um, now I wanted to talk a little bit about how we can get a category out of a 3D TQFT. Before I was saying that um, this category is sort of the thing that connects the three edges or the three corners of this triangle. Um, and so I wanted to illustrate why we actually expect to get a category out of uh, these line operators in a 3D topological quantum field theory. So the first thing to say is that, well, my category has objects, of course. The objects of the category are these line-like defects I can insert in my in my TQFT. In Chern-Simons theory, these were the Wilson lines um, that you're probably familiar with. but in other topological quantum field theories, they can be more general things than just wealth and lines. The morphisms in my category are realized as local operators that can sit at the junction of two line operators. And the composition of morphisms uh, arises as the collision of these junctions, uh, which I've, I've illustrated on the right over here. So I have three line operators L, L prime, and L prime prime, and two morphisms connecting them, O and O prime. And I can bring these two junctions together to uh, get a morphism between my two outer line operators, L and L prime prime, um, in, in this fashion. Uh, and so in this, in this way, we can turn line operators in a TQFT into a category. Um, in general dimensions, the one dimensional operators are going to give you a category in this way. So if you're familiar with categories of brains in two dimensions, this is the exact same types of pictures that you saw there. Is, is there a monoidal structure on, on this slide? Uh, yes, I did not draw it, uh, but there is definitely a monoidal structure. Oh, I didn't 
I didn't include that slide, did I? Yes, there is definitely a monoidal structure and it comes by uh, taking two line operators and then bringing them together. Um, so this monoidal structure comes from fusing line operators with one another, but it's a little bit more than a, braid, a monoidal structure. Um, it's actually a braided monoidal structure. And that comes from uh, drawing pictures like this, where we allow our line operators to wrap around one another. So the general expectation is that the line operators in this 3D TQFT don't just form a category, but they actually form a braided monoidal category. Uh, so that's a feature that's not uh, going to be seen in a two-dimensional setting. Um, in this three-dimensional setting, the the structure is yet richer than in two dimensions. But uh, I'm confused. In this uh, uh, 3D Chern Simons story, is it just a braided monoidal category which is equivalent to uh, to some representations of the quantum group or what? it's not it's completely uh like, no that's that's not... that's how you should that's how you should think about it it's going to be like this this triangle that i was drawing before isn't just some equivalence of categories it's an equivalence of braided tensor categories hmm. at, at the very least it should be okay okay so then if i kind of navely as people did in the 90s uh, uh, a color uh, the line in my 3d manifold by a representation this is exactly what if this corresponds to your alpha whatever alpha prime yeah uh, exactly yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. so the the objects of my category you could think of as the colorings of of these lines um so if i were to start making knot invariants i would have uh components of my knot labeled by these uh objects of my category um exactly as you're as you're suggesting yeah because i remember that in razansky witten i mean people mathematicians try to to make a parallel um, analogy kind of very literal analogy with with chern simons and the idea was to color line with objects of db Koch. Of yeah paper color yeah okay yeah, that, that's exactly uh, how you should think about it. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, the, the last little bit of abstract nonsense I wanted to mention is what happens when we have a coupling to background flat connections, um, as we do in these uh, uh, quantum field theories that come from 3DN equals four um, with Higgs branch flavor symmetries. Uh, these were, um, what I had on the previous slide called uh, B-type deformations. So B-type for me just means it's a deformation by a complexified flat connection. But when you have such a deformation, um, you can actually enlarge what you mean by line operators to include line operators that uh, source background flat connections with some given holonomy. And you can then consider a much larger category C um, that decomposes as a direct sum of categories labeled by elements in my group uh, of, of symmetries. And each uh, fiber of this corresponds to line operators with a given holonomy. So I choose some base point and I compute the holonomy of the background flat connection at sources and label my line operators by what that holonomy is. And two line operators that sit in different categories, so L and L prime sitting in G and G prime fibers, um, they're going to have trivial um, morphisms between them if G and G prime aren't the same. Because this is a flat connection, I can move this loop up or down and it can't change the holonomy. Um, and so if my two line operators have different holonomies, they can't be connected at all. So in this way, this direct sum of different categories um, is, is a direct sum in the sense that any two fibers can't talk to one another. There's no morphisms in the category in these different blocks. 
Yeah, but mathematically I'm a bit confused because if G is not a finite group, but just a Lie group, so the direct sum should be kind of replaced by direct integral or something. Yeah, definitely. I was I was being a little loose with what a direct sum meant. Um, but yeah, if it if it's a if it's a continuous group, definitely it should be like a direct integral rather than a direct sum. Yes, definitely. And we're gonna be really interested in those situations where we don't have a finite group of symmetries we're coupling to, but really have some continuous group like the hypercalar isometries of some target. Okay, um, I wanted to just go through a simple example of, uh, of, a, of a topological quantum field theory that arises in this fashion, uh, one that has been mentioned a couple times before, namely Rosensky-Witten theory. And I'm gonna be interested in Rosensky-Witten theory, which has a target uh, that's C2 or the cotangent bundle of C. Uh, this is, rises as a topological twist of this hypermultiplet theory I was mentioning at the beginning, where we only have matter fields and there's no gauge fields around whatsoever. Um, one slick way of writing this twisted theory is uh, in this formula I wrote here, where um, A is some fixed background flat connection uh, DA is the corresponding covariant derivative, and my uh, two fields are uh, denoted Z alpha and Z beta, or well, Z alpha, where alpha is one and two. And the um, Zs are themselves not just functions on space time, but they're actually in homogeneous forms. And so I've written my decomposition in two homogeneous parts. Um, on the right-hand side, the sort of function part of Z is those fields I was calling Z before. The higher form components contain the, for the fermions I was mentioning, um, as well as derivatives of my um, the complex conjugate field Z bar. Um, if you look at the local operators in this uh, twisted quantum field theory, you find functions on uh, T star C. Uh, these are polynomials in the Zs that I have here. Um, and this T star C you should think of as the, the Higgs branch of my hypermultiplet, or rather the target of my Rosansky-Witten theory. Uh, one thing I want to mention is that this is actually a type of Chern-Simons theory that's got the usual ADA type of action, um, but it's not an uh, it's not a bosonic Chern-Simons theory. It's actually a, a Chern-Simons theory based off of the Lie super algebra PSL one slash one. So it's the purely odd two dimensional abelian Lie algebra um, that that leads to this action. And we can deform it by a, a background flat connection for the SU2 symmetry or SL2 symmetry that acts on C2 uh, via hypercalar isometries. Um, so one way to get at its category of line operators is illustrated here. Um, if you're familiar with uh, two-dimensional Landau-Ginzburg models, this uh, result probably isn't super scary, um, but the basic idea is to take a line operator in three dimensions and actually view it as a boundary condition for a two-dimensional theory whose target is the loop space of my original target. And the reduction uh, can be done as I suggest here. Um, and what you end up finding is that there's a kinetic term corresponding to the loop space of my target T star C. Um, and we have a super potential that pairs Z with the holomorphic derivative of C. So I've got a sort of loopy matrix factorization category describing the category of brains in the two dimensional theory with a humongous target. And so the 
um, expectation then is that the category of line operators in this 3D topological quantum field theory, this rosensky witten theory, um, is related to the category of matrix factorizations on the loop space of T star C with a super potential that um, is this uh, sort of kinetic term around the, the circle that I've reduced on. Um, when I choose a, an infinitesimal holonomy, A, that's sufficiently small, um, this actually admits a nice finite dimensional approximation where I look at matrix factorizations on C2, where my superpotential pairs the SU2 moment map with my uh, choice of, um, of infinitesimal holonomy. And so um, when A is zero, you end up finding the category of coherent sheaves on C2, or perhaps you should really be talking about its derived category. Um, and for generic A, you end up finding a totally trivial category, uh, category of vector spaces. Um, so from here, we can start trying to flesh out the rest of this triangle, but um, I think it might be good to stop here and save those things for next time because we've reached uh, an hour. Um, but are there yeah, any if, questions if on this want, construction? If you want to 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 kind of to finish something, uh, you can do this. I mean, we, we are um, but if you see, I think yeah, I think it might be good to stop here. Mm -hmm. um, and then next time I'll be able to connect this construction in terms of matrix factorizations to to a, a quantum group and then also to a vertex operator algebra. Uh, but um, this matrix factorization, I mean, uh, it's on the loop space, so I don't know how mathematically it is sound. Uh, uh. Um, so uh, Nadler Benzvi talked a lot about matrix factorizations on loop spaces. Um, I think this, this sort of finite dimensional approximation is maybe the sort of dodgy mm -hmm. thing. Um, I, it sort of involves some infinite, infinite dimensional version of a of Knorr periodicity. Um, and so I think this thing is OK. And then this uh, equivalence expected equivalence to this finite dimensional model is probably the least robust, least robust statement that I've made here. Um, but categories of matrix factorizations on loop spaces is, I think, um, a, a reasonable thing to consider, although it definitely goes down the, like there, there's lots of things you have to worry about in terms of uh, support conditions on what types of matrix factorizations you allow. And if you want to give this a, like a braided tensor structure, it takes a lot more work. Um, but um, I think um, I think that's already been done. Yeah, by, uh, by, by, by Nadler and people around. Sorry, maybe it was Francis. Uh, yeah, Nadler definitely, um, and I think Francis. Or maybe it was Ben's V. Um, yeah, but definitely these loop spaces um, are quite hard, but they actually are a nice way to connect to vertex algebras where the loopy aspects of this of this target space translate to the the modes of a vertex algebra in a, in a nice and clean way. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, okay, uh, so um, more questions? Well, if there are no questions, thank you very much. Uh, for... Yeah, thank you for, for all of the questions. In the meantime, uh, next time I was going to mention some connections to uh, quantum groups and vertex operator algebras in this in this simple example of a 
of Rosansky Witten theory with targets D2. Um, and then in the next lectures, I'll describe the generalizations that we'll need to get to, to the, the quantum group UQSLN um, and the things that you have to do to, to generalize this story. Yeah, uh, okay, great. Keep in mind that uh, 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 there are no physicists, as far as I can say, in this seminar. So, yeah. yeah, I was trying to keep it um, fairly elementary, um, yeah. only using things that mathematicians are roughly familiar with, like brains and two dimensions. I didn't want to expect you to know about topological twists or anything like that, uh -huh. so I tried to give you a, a run through of what that what that entails yeah okay all right uh thank you and uh well uh, see you tomorrow then yeah great thanks again i'll see you all tomorrow uh -huh.